Welcome to the Center for Global Higher Education Seminar Webinar 305. Uh, I'm Martin Benavides, and I will be sharing um, this session and, uh, on the World Class University Regional Responses and Academic Careers in Latin America. Uh, before I hand over to the presenters, uh, there are some brief housekeeping points to mention. Okay, this 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 uh, this this webinar is, is being recorded. Uh, uh, a transcript of the chat uh, function conversation will also be posted. Um, please uh, keep yourself mute unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. And um, also, uh, uh, there is no need to have uh, your video uh, on during the webinar, but please do so when asking a question. We also recommend using the speaker view so you can move clearly, see who is talking. Uh, to ask a question, use the chat function and write out the question you wish to ask. At the end of the presentation, if your question is selected, you will be invited to ask if, if yourself directly. When invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video and state your name and where are you from. Okay, so welcome again. Uh, we will begin now the second webinar of this Latin American series. Today with a very important uh, topic related uh, to the idea of world-class universities and the regional responses from, from Latin America. We have uh, two speakers today. Uh, each of one will have approximately 15 minutes, and we hope to have time for some questions at the end of the presentation. We will uh, we begin with uh, Dr. Imanol Ordorica, who is a, a PhD from Stanford. He's professor of social sciences and education at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. His research has focused on power, politics, and change in higher education, social movements in education, globalization, and higher education, among other topics. He has published nine author and five edited books, more than 40 chapters, and more than 30 peer reviews articles. He has received international recognition as distinguished visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg from 2018 to 2022. Uh, he also got the Fran Tobo Junior University Chair from 2004 and 2005 at the University of Virginia, and, and Chair uh, Tit Mexican uh, Alfonso Reyes at the Institut des Autitudes de l'Amérique Latine in 2006 at the Université uh, Paris, Paris uh, 3, uh, Sorbonne Nouvelle. Uh, after him, uh, we will have also today uh, uh, Dr. Monica Bonifaz. Uh, he's a professor at the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, PUC, in the Academic Department of Management Sciences. She's a member of the research group in higher education at the PUC. Monica has been dean of the undergraduate school of management and head of the Academic Department of Management Sciences. She also has been member of board of director and has held managerial positions in the public sector as well as in multinational company. She holds a doctorate in strategic management from the Consortium of University of Peru with a minor in innovation in higher education and a master of sciences in information management from the University of Sheffield in England. She works on topics related to university management, government and of the academic career and development of research capabilities, particularly in private university. She has been a fellow of the DAT of Germany, the British Council and Erasmus, as well as the Columbus Association to participate in projects of teaching internationalization and prom promotion of research in university higher education. So we have uh, two very great speakers today. 
and we, as agree with, the, with them, we will begin with Dr. Odorica for uh, 15 minutes. The floor is yours, Dr. Odorica. Ah, we can hear you, the, the micro. Sorry. Right. Thank you, Martin. Uh, uh, I want to thank the Center for Global Higher Education and uh, Martin Simon Martinson, uh, in particular, for the invitation to participate in this panel with my colleague, uh, Monica Bonifaz from Peru. We have heard from each other, read from each other, and we are now meeting uh, virtually. I hope that maybe we can uh, see each other soon. Actually, I, I hope to see many of you soon uh, in a direct way because it's been too long. And while um, webinar and Zoom have made uh, sessions like today's possible uh, and has expanded our ability to uh, discuss and exchange uh, experiences all over the world, it has also hampered the possibility of personal interaction, which has been so fruitful and so great in personal and academic terms. And uh, I would use just my uh, very close friendship with uh, Dr. Simon Martinson, which makes me a very privileged person uh, and to have been able for many, many years, not only to interact via Zoom, but uh, in, a, in a very personal way here, there, and everywhere as the sun goes. Um, so uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, I, I'm going to start um, moving back a little bit more than 100 years to uh, a very important uh, highlight point in Latin American higher education, which is the 1918 struggle for university reform at the University of Córdoba in Argentina. Uh, the students there uh, at the very early part of the century uh, reacted against a very highly uh, uh, religiously committed university in the midst of reforms that were going on. Uh, we could call, it, call them today uh, the early 20th century modernization reforms uh, in that country, and where some very key issues uh, were established uh, in order to create uh, what I call a Latin American uh, higher education tradition or university tradition to focus more on this type of institutions. Basically, the tenants for this uh, tradition were, were um, university autonomy, uh, on which uh, um, the notion of social commitment and uh, very relevant role for universities in the development of nations and uh, in their ability to be sovereign nations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, not an emerging and already emerged power a very strong or powerful country in the north of the continent, the United States, and really provided universities with a significant role in the conduction of the economy, in the creation of uh, the cadres of professionals and uh, discipline-based intellectuals that could uh, bring our countries out from the eve of the colonial days into a modern era. Uh, this, uh, I'm not gonna uh, expand more on that, but I would say that this Latin American tradition, we have discussed it before in this webinar, uh, can be summarized as the state building universities, public, large public institutions that were strongly committed to the development of the nation state, the economy, in the era of the expansion of the welfare state in Latin America. It was never a welfare state compared uh, to other nations in Europe or even the United States, but with its own particular features, 
many times mixed with authoritarian regimes. Uh, there was a strong commitment by uh, um, the government, public uh, officials and governments for the financing of these institutions. And there was a uh, synergy between university development and nation uh, and state development from the 1920s to the late 1970s, I could say. Um, with what we all have recognized as the end of the welfare state, uh, the coming about of uh, the ideas of what we now call neoliberalism by Hayek and Friedman, uh, the putting up of these uh, policies and new public philosophies in the 1980s uh, by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. The world changed substantially. Uh, and in Latin America, the, the, this was no difference. Um, what essentially happened was uh, like a total uh, fracture between the role and the development and the support for public higher education institutions uh, from the state, the idea that the state needed to do cost benefit analysis about what were the real um, elements that these universities were providing for national development. And it was not even cast in these uh, terms. It was for productivity, for the economy, uh, a very economized reading of what was what were public universities doing at a high cost. It was mostly uh, portrayed always as a cost and not as an investment. And um, uh, public financing for public universities was curtailed. Uh, it was limited in very strong ways for decades. And uh, there was a very strong, there were very strong demands uh, for the connections between universities uh, and industry, universities and economic development in a much more private way. Simon has discussed this uh, very extensively in several books uh, on his ideas of how uh, the economization of universities really brought about um, uh, like a, a reductionist view of uh, these institutions in terms of the production of private goods, which they always produced, but uh, disregarding the role uh, in the production of public and uh, we could say we could say common goods uh, in our nations. This uh, generated, I, I have argued often, uh, loss of uh, university identity all over the continent. Uh, it is uh, with this, I, I want to make a, a spe specific note that although there, we can talk about uh, Latin American university tradition, this does not make uh, uh, Latin American institutions completely homogeneous. There are a lot of difference too uh, between countries and even between regions uh, in the southern part of the continent, I mean south of the U.S. border. And uh, in spite of that, we can track some public policies that were put in place that were very similar everywhere. And we can also look at uh, how our universities started to wander all over the place, trying to find a role in the new economic and social um, allocations uh, made to them by the state and the public. Uh, and I would say that public uh, opinion was very much driven by state discourse uh, of productivity, of private institutions being much more efficient. Uh, there, this is uh, the time from the 1980s, uh, last century, until the first decade of this century, uh, the huge expansion of private enrollments, which makes uh, this uh, region of the world uh, one with the highest private enrollments uh, anywhere else in the, in the world. So um, with this loss of identity, uh, our countries, which were already looking north 
in terms of what economic development and public policy should look like, started looking at a very unique model of higher education, which we have labeled collectively uh, as the elite uh, research university in the United States. And later, uh, some of our colleagues, uh, Alba and Tayak, uh, fundamentally, have labeled this the world-class university. And uh, this world-class model of university was trying, uh, uh, many governments and university administrations were trying to mimic. And I use the word mimic uh, with a lot of purpose because uh, given the huge differences that almost every country in the world, in Europe, uh, and in other more marginal regions or continents were looking to a very unique relationship between higher education and industry, higher education and the economy, higher, higher education and the polity of, uh, this, of, the, of this nation, the United States. And in spite of that, in spite of the uniqueness of that model, uh, the idea that higher education could be so strongly and tightly connected to the uh, uh, economy and so heavily oriented towards the production of private goods that could be exchangeable in the market became uh, mainstream and became dominant ev almost everywhere in the world. And I could certainly argue that in all of the Latin American countries, we have the presence of this, uh, of this discourse. With that, we had, for example, in Mexico, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, and Chile at least, the adoption of uh, what I have called uh, pseudo market policies uh, for the uh, establishment of merit pay systems for faculty and the financing of institutions and research projects which was based on external monies that were not part of the overall subsidies for institutions. Uh, nowadays, uh, faculty in Mexico in higher at the higher education level receive two thirds, uh, at least two thirds of our income from merit pay systems, which allegedly are connected to the notion that we are exchanging our research and teaching goods to uh, market behaviors. We are allocated points uh, every four or five years that will um, grant us a certain amount of money that of course does never, uh, is never included in the establishment of benefits and pensions and stuff like that. Well, um, I don't wanna extend, overextend in my, the allocation of my, the time for my presentation, but, um, what is the problem now? Uh, I think that uh, uh, a few years before the uh, regional celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Cordoba movement, the Latin American uh, public universities started to broaden uh, our scope about what, was, what is really the role of our institutions in contemporary societies. Given the failures of the neoliberal model, the increase in uh, uh, differences and inequalities uh, in our countries and almost all over the world, and, and the questioning of a lot of policies that had been put in place with so much strength and, uh, and, and so, uh, so much uh, intellectual security about how uh, the privatization, marketization of higher education would produce uh, a, a common good and public good everywhere and would select the good uh, higher education institutions. This is a discourse that we have all analyzed and we have looked at and the policies that have stemmed from that discourse. So uh, I think that uh, the uh, meeting in Cordoba in 2018, which was celebration, a hundred year celebration, but also the regional conference uh, for higher education there was essentially looking at, is it possible to recreate a Latin American higher education tradition? 
Is there something in the old model of the uh, state building university that we can look at? Is there uh, anything that we can uh, take from our historical development and uh, recreate uh, in an intelligent way to bring our institutions forward? And if secularization uh, was a key point of the Cordova reform in 1918, I think that there's a sort of secularization that has to be brought about vis-a-vis -vis the dominant model, the mainstream model, the neoliberal idea of how society and higher education has to be organized. And this has to be questioned severely with uh, very important consequences for public institutions. I'm just gonna point out a set of key reforms for public universities in Latin America that are being discussed currently and that are uh, the object of a strong debate. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that these are uh, consensus, but there, there's a strong polarization over these issues. The first one, which everybody seems to be agree upon is the putting in the center of uh, university development, the idea of social commitment. No, so, not social responsibility because that concept has been totally, um, how could you say, eroded by uh, even businesses that have become socially responsible. Have you ever looked at the Coke, uh, Coca-Cola little can that says this uh, Coca-Cola is a socially responsible enterprise? Well, it is not that that we're looking at because some institutions are looking at the uh, at the world standards for social responsibility. And, it, and, and even though there have been important advances, they are using um, uh, glass cups instead of styrofoam to keep campuses a little bit cleaner. That is not the sort of thing that we're talking about with social commitment. We're talking about universities that are heavily involved in the development of contemporary uh, societies in Latin America. Of course, this implies a second point that is uh, strategic for the development of higher education in the region. And this is the repoliticization of the university. This has been a very important argument that I have been trying to make. Um, I don't know, Simon, you might recall it, but uh, I would say that at, at least for one decade. And it's very much based on the idea of how universities in Mexico were framed in a depoliticization a uh, very open depolitization discourse in the 1940s and 50s uh, of the last century, and uh, which we have to overcome and totally reverse. Because uh, when I talk about depolitization, uh, repolitization of universities, I'm not saying that we have be to become unions or, poli or, or political actors in the traditional sense. What uh, I, I am trying to discuss is that universities have to become involved in the most salient and most relevant political debates of our era. And these are all over the place. And uh, we can even look at the sustainable development goals by UNESCO and, uh, and they, they look good. They seem to be a, a nice uh, footprint for the development of higher ed. And this is what the world uh, conference in higher education, which was, by the way, very downplayed uh, uh, compared to the one that took place 11 years ago or, or, or more. Um, but it's totally depolit depoliticized. It, they seem to be like uh, the Ten Commandments of the Catholic religion or something like that. It's, uh, there is no debate around it. Uh, we, and it doesn't touch upon issues that are very relevant that we discussed in the previous a webinar about immigration all over the world, about the issues of violence, about the topics of um, uh, gender and race discrimination and violence too. So uh, uh, I would say that the key notion for the reorganization and reorientation of universities in Latin America is this idea of repolitization. Of course, repolitiz repolitization of higher education has two consequences that are key to the development of the new Latin American tradition. We have to reestablish autonomy, which had been eroded by public policies that used uh, um, like uh, focused or, or pinpointed financing of projects, faculty and institutions 
as opposed to an overall subsidy for these universities um, in, in the idea that universities themselves have enough independence to um, tackle the most uh, relevant debates and topics of contemporary society in a creative and, and totally independent way and, which, and with very different viewpoints because we don't claim that universities are homogeneous. The second issue is obviously democratization. If our institutions continue to be these um, mid-age organized and dressed up uh, organizations where we have rectors and bishops and uh, it's, it's amazing how the, the key postings of universities follow up on the, on the Catholic church. We have to broaden the possibility of participation, decision making, and the building of uh, agreements between opposing views about the nation and the university itself. Because nowadays what has happened, at least in Latin America, is that every time there is a key difference of uh, the reform projects for a university, we have a big conflict. Our organizations are not built to deal with difference and to deal with disagreements and to deal with political conflict in a different way than clashes, complete clashes between the institutions. And I'm gonna uh, yeah, finish- Yeah, we are running out of time. Really fast. Yes. Um, gender equality is a key, key uh, topic. Universal enrollments, if a hundred years ago, the society decided that basic education had to be universal. We have to do so with uh, undergrad project programs in higher education. And finally, we need to have tuition free public uh, uh, education and, of course, public financing in order to subsidize this. I'm sorry for the extension over time. And uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriga. Uh, very interesting presentation. Now we pass uh, to Monica, please. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, I, I want to thank you to uh, Professor Simon Martinson, Imanol, and you, Martin, for this, uh, this good morning discussion that we are going to have. Uh, I have a presentation, so I'm going to share my, my file. Please let me know if you can see it. Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, this uh, space for uh, discussing about some topics related to world class university and other prominent ideas of higher education, evolution, and development in our region. I will try to um, just talk about. Uh, three questions you posed in the program. There were, there were six questions in the program. I think uh, I can talk about uh, three of them, the purpose of higher education, something that Professor Ordorica has pointed out very well. Uh, if Latin American universities can uh, both contribute to global science and also uh, be part of the advancing, uh, advancing uh, agenda of national development. And the third one, if the if our universities in Latin America are only take, taking attention on this um, international mission and, and the rankings, or it, it also they are also worried about social and economic uh, growth in our countries. First of all, I want to thank that, as Professor Ordorica has said, uh, in Latin America, th there is no homogeneous model of university. We have different models of universities. And we can also say that in the region, we, we can see two main trends in uh, how governments manage this uh, public policy on higher education. By one side, you have countries like Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil, where states have paid a lot of attention and, and public investment in some uh, public universities. So public universities or state universities are focused uh, mainly on research, and they have developed this merit paid systems for academic careers. So professors are um, like induced to produce a lot of knowledge in order to be part of a more uh, global model system. And by the other side, we have other countries that uh, opted by uh, opted for liberalization of higher education. 
And in these countries, we can see the cases of uh, Chile first, uh, Colombia and Peru. And this was the point, the starting point of uh, our research on uh, the, the role of private universities in these countries, okay? So as we can see here in, in, in the PowerPoint, we, we see in 20 years observation that some countries, also, um, some countries trends to develop uh, research more intensively and others have another way of uh, facing the challenge of research in higher education in the global context of, um, I can say, the global international uh, knowledge system. Um, specifically, I want to talk about the four, four private uh, nonprofit cases. These are private traditional universities, because in Latin America, as Professor Dorica said, we have many confessional universities, and in particular, in some countries, uh, religious, Catholic, confessional universities play an important role in the national development systems. And also, we have private traditional universities that are not confessional. They're uh, uh, private ones, but with, without profit. This is very rare because uh, from the 90s, uh, the, this liberalization and privatization model and move to uh, the, a higher education system, very diversified with lots of uh, uh, private universities that tend to be more for profit, market oriented. But these four cases are four cases that we call it traditionals. They were universities founded much earlier than the liberalization reforms. And we're talking about Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, our university Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, Los Andes of Colombia uh, and La University Cayetano Heredia, also from Peru. We have two cases of Peru because in, in these two universities, we have the same, the, the, the range of disciplines we want to observe. El Católica del Perú don't, doesn't offer medicine programs, but Cayetano Heredia, uh, it does. And they are both part of the consortium of universities in Peru. What we, do, uh, what we uh, did in our research is try to analyze the the behavior of these universities through their um, academic production uh, between uh, 1998 to uh, 2017. And what we saw is that the four universities moved toward these models of um, uh, bibliographic production, okay? And also patent production. This it, is it's, it's like a proxy of research and knowledge uh, production. And they were, the four were moving uh, very aggressively uh, in this trend, but uh, there, there's something happens when we saw them in, compa in comparison. They're, they're, they were not so different. Two of them are more or less the same size, the same uh, 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 financing system, and the other one are small, but also we can say they're more or less the same in, 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 the, in the sense of understanding higher education uh, offering in our in, in, in our own countries. But we saw really uh, important differences. This is a general differences. So we decided to move in a much more uh, comparable scenario. So we posed some questions too, and we wanted to make this comparison much more from organizational perspectives. No? And, and our research questions stated that how do the global and local institution, institutional conditions and the historical legacies of these four cases are intervening, strengthening, or weakening the development of research? Uh, this is important for us because we want to identify and understand the conditions or the combination of these conditions that explain why the development of research and knowledge production are so different among these four, uh, four cases, given the uh, traditions of a uh, university, and especially these four uh, private traditional universities. We also pursue that with this better understanding, uh, we can also know these uh, cases agendas in, in order to understand if they are moved only by this like global market uh, uh, philosophy or these, um, competition sense, or if they are also worried about a national agenda or a social de development agenda. 
uh, how do we conduct the study? We carried out uh, this research from the organizational perspective, and, and we uh, uh, use the comparative case studies in, with an analytical framework that uses both the institutional conditions and the organizational condition factors that intervene in the development of the research in the cases. Uh, the study of these four traditional universities um, was made upon the um, descriptive statistical approximation to scientific production measured through publications with affiliation in, in these cases and a qualitative analysis of 30 interviews and the documentary review of these four institutions. This is a mixed approach and hybrid approach of the research. It was uh, uh, conducted in, 19, in 2019 press, uh, in a presence way in, in these three countries. Um, we use the descriptive analysis because we need to have uh, um, indicators to compare the cases. So what we, uh, what we did is to build a database. Uh, and in this database, with, oh, this database is completely uh, built, built with um, public data of the professors. Uh, we know that universities cannot share the information of the professors. So we built this database of 1551 professors of six disciplines, biology, chemistry, and physics by one side and medicine, psychology, and engineering by the other side. The analysis is, was conducted by title. It means that a, a title to an, an author, a professor hired that is a professor that is currently working in, in, in the university. Um, the, the database used was a scopus, it's most, more general. It included a chapter of books and books in serious, serial books. So it, it, it has more information about academic and scientific production of these uh, 15, 15 uh, 51 uh, professors database. Um, when we compare, the data of the professors and their academic production, we observe more or less the same trend. In science, obviously, in scientific disciplines, we see much more intensive uh, production in Catholic University of Chile, but also the uh, Universidad de los Andes was growing up very, very fast. And we, when we compare medicine, engineering, and psychology, we, we saw that uh, Cayetano Heredia with medicine moves faster uh, than uh, Católica del Perú, but Católica del Perú increases the, uh, the production because of engineering uh, disciplines or engineering profession. Um, we, we wanted to know what, what is related to, to that uh, growth of uh, academic production. So we use the uh, approximation of critical masses of researchers in order to know if this, uh, this grown of the production is related to the capability of the universities to develop uh, critical masses of professors. It, 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 this is, uh, it is a perspective that uh, let you understand that um, if you have uh, more people doing more or less the same thing, the others are going to be moved to the same trend. No? The, the greater the common interest, the greater the willingness of the members to have uh, to achieve the same interest. Okay, so we conducted an analysis. Uh, we, don't, we didn't want to work with productivity, so we used like a proxy of logarithmic uh, comparisons. So we, we don't want to compare totals, but the, the logarithmic understanding of the production. And what we saw is this, and that makes uh, some sense for us, that in two cases, they, uh, they, they could develop a strong uh, critical masses of professors with research capabilities with international uh, uh, quality standards. And in other two cases, they, they wouldn't be they, they couldn't be able to do that and and we asked what is that what is that related to that we you have here these two cases with a strong uh, commu academic community capable of producing at least one paper with international standards and in the other side you see two cases that are much more dependable on the what we say an elite of researchers so you have 
few researchers producing a lot and there's a, a, a community, a small community producing less than the average of their uh, comparison uh, peers, compared peers. So the second question we ask about that, if, um, if there is the willingness of these four cases to hire professors with special foreign or local degrees trajectories. It, it is related to the preferences of the university to build an academic community with different characteristics. And this is more or less with the same uh, strategy of comparison. Uh, we want to analyze if university have at least uh, the disposition to implement policies or uh, internal regulations in favor of hiring professors from outside with international trajectories. Because we understand that an international professor related to uh, international networks uh, would be able to do more research than the others that are more from the local community or from the, the own university. And we saw the same thing. We saw that uh, PUC Chile and Los Andes uh, have, a, um, have developed an academic uh, community composed by this, this heterogeneous academic uh, community with international professors, with uh, professors from the country, but with international uh, development degrees or the, the develop, uh, international degrees or degrees from outside universities. And we have that in the case of Peru, we couldn't be able to do that. It, it is true that Chile has a, a strong uh, public policy on Becas Chile, and this is a strong weapon of uh, strengthening the research capabilities. But Colombia doesn't have this program from private universities. Colombian private universities don't receive help from the state. This is a very particular case. In the case of Peru, we saw that um, it is very common that um, the community is a very endogenous community. And it, it was the other question that, can, that move us to another analysis that is not part of this presentation. If, what is this of uh, endogamous practice in academic governance? How, how can some universities in, uh, incorporate to the academic career uh, peers that come from different parts of the world and others that move inside their own community? There are a lot of empirical studies about academic inbreeding, uh, and this, this research revealed, revealed that the relationship between endogamous practices and low science uh, productivity is high. And this phenomenon uh, usually emerged from these institutional practices of hiring people from our own communities. It means that we hired more based on trust of our uh, 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 known peers than from uh, using a standardized metrics to evaluate, for example, merits, okay? Merits of academic production, merits of uh, international uh, teaching trajectories, et cetera. And this is very, very well studied by Godichot and, and Alba. Um, after doing this, descriptive analysis, we, we saw evidence of the difference of the difference uh, of these universities, but we didn't understand, we, we didn't have the understanding of the processes that move to that uh, evidence. So we move to the qualitative analysis. And for this qualitative analysis, we support, um, uh, we, we support our analysis in two predominant perspectives, the new institutionalism, and the imprint theory. At the beginning, we were discussing about uh, the path dependence or the imprint theory, and uh, it was much more consistent and much more strong, the elements provided by the imprint theory. So we move to the qualitative analysis to uh, with a model that can be um, well uh, suited with the descriptive analysis and the qualitative analysis. And in the model, we propose that the institutional mechanism, that is regulation, normative, and cognitive cultural elements, they condition the uh, decision of research development in these four private universities. This, this means it's global and local pressures 
move universities through research development. And you can observe that uh, move through institutional uh, organizational uh, policies and regulation. They are uh, registered in their development institutional plans. They are observed, you can observe them in the organizational structures that are um, the, um, implemented to support research. And something that is very important, you can see them on the uh, professor statutes. Uh, this is the regulation of academic career in each case. And how, how uh, re the requirements, how high are the requirements in these academic regulations or how low are the requirements in these regulations. And we also propose that in print, this is the identity, the founding values, this important issue of the legacies of Latin American universities, the culture of the university, if it, if it is much more oriented to teaching or to teaching and research. We cannot say here in Latin America, there is a research university, but you can say that we have universities focused on teaching and we have universities that are trying to move to the model of teaching and research, much more intensive and research too. And the way that the university do the things, the traditional ways to organize the governance, to organize the process of selection and self-selections of the members. And this is elements, these are elements provided by the imprint theory. Oops. Uh, these are the, cons uh, the constructs that we use to analyze. We, for institutions, we use regulation, normative mechanism, cognitive cultural mechanism. We have the leg legislation, the qualitative assurance conditions. We have for normative accreditation, the role of rankings and the research systems. That is a point very important. Uh, research systems, local national research systems are very relevant elements. And the cognitive uh, cultural mechanism. In imprint, we have the historical legacies, the founding values, the culture of research and teaching, the forms of selection and self-selection of members. And for research development, we use for uh, to have an approximation of the process, the existence of research police, research policies, development institutional plans, research structures and norms and uh, regulations of how to conduct research inside the university and the requirements to professors to perform research as one of the obligations, mandatory functions, uh, basic functions of the academic career. Um, Monica, two, 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 three more minutes. Okay, that's, I'm, I'm finishing, thanks. In the qualitative approach, we use a multiple compare case, uh, structural and focused comparison. Uh, the sample of uh, interviews uh, was a deliberate sample. We just interviews um, government and management, uh, persons in government and management positions. Uh, we interview uh, 30 persons, 28 uh, were registered and transcripted. And we apply thematic content analysis provided by Kukarts and using Atlas T uh, 1924. What we saw, uh, PUC, uh, th those uh, Catholic universities in Chile and Peru, th they have very high reference to Catholic funding values, emphasis uh, in the culture of investigation in, uh, in Chile, but very strong teaching culture in the case of Catholic University of Peru. In Los Andes of Colombia and Cayetano Heredia, the same is very consistent the reference of, of the founding values. Uh, in two cases, very strong reference to research of the of founding values in, in, in the moment of creation of the university. But in the four cases, a strong social commitment, as uh, Professor Ordorica said, not social responsibility, social commitment, social commitment traduced in the role of formation and the role of research. We, what we saw in summary, that university uh, depends a lot on uh, founding um, competitive public funds, but only in three cases they depend on that. Colombia hasn't that pressure. And in the, norma, in the, normative, in the normative elements, uh, constant, there was a constant low reference to the influence of ranking. 
But in the cognitive aspects, cognitive and cultural aspects, what we saw is a high reference of the competition in the market and uh, a high need to preserve prestigious and differentiation. And this is very interesting because they all uh, founded uh, their positions on prestige as a way to uh, um, highlight the need to um, um, keep the role of universities as an institutions committed to the society. Um, in, in general, what we saw is universities with teaching and research uh, imprints are much more able to have and development better uh, research production in terms of these proxy measures. And in general, what we can say is that there is no research universities in Latin America, but we have research and teaching universities. But it is very hard to develop that uh, because it, it not depends only on local or global influences, but it's very, very influenced, very much influenced by uh, uh, organizational heritage, legacies. The development of research under the preeminence of the world-class university or the global emerging model is, is a result of different combinations. And I can say that probably there is a much more focus on being part of this national or pan-national network for development science and these expert communities and these learning organizations that want to move in the knowledge society, in the knowledge economy but with the sense and the conscious of that the global market is a very is, is a pressing a very very strong pressing institution and also the the regulation of the states so as a final idea is that regulation have less homogenizing effects and that if we can understand the traditions of the different universities we have especially the private ones in our region we can understand that this, um, this search for prestigious and this, this notion of competition in the sector it is very well tied to the need to strengthen their commitment to society, sustainability, and economic development. And we could observe that and it, when we saw this research, own, the, the, their own research agenda. And that, that is all, Martin, I think. I also Thank you. That. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, uh, we have uh, eight minutes for a conversation. Uh, you can you can raise your question in, in you can write in the chat. Um, I, I, I'm going to begin with one 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 question to Dr. Uh, Imanol Ordorica. Um, you said that this idea of the loss of identity of Latin American universities. Um, and you, you relate uh, that with basically what happened in the world and, and the regions and, and in the region uh, on the 90s. No? Do you think there are other institutional, political forces that also play a role in this uh, result of, of the losing of identity in Latin, in Latin American universities? Um, I wonder if, are, are we going to get all of the questions together and then respond or we go? No, one? I think one, 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 one to okay. one. No? I'll, yeah. I'll keep it brief. There are, there are several issues like uh, the debt crisis in Latin America during the 1980s, uh, deep financial debt with the IMF and, uh, and the way in which uh, the IMF intervened in policies. Then the uh, growth of uh, in number and in uh, cruelty of the authoritarian regimes, dictatorships in Argentina, Brazil, uh, Chile, Uruguay, uh, Peru, and Bolivia at some point. And uh, so uh, I'd say there are many components for, for this uh, critical situation of higher education that uh, developed into this identity crisis. But basically, uh, I argue that there's a loss of uh, synchronicity with the government development plans uh, mm -hmm. for the society in general and the, and the economy. 
and what universities were trying to do. Great. Um, Simon, you, you, you have a, a question, I think. Martin, um, just a quick comment. Um, I, I mean, I think that, you know, Imanol's um, perspective um, is that we should rethink or reconsider, you know, the role of the, uh, of the research university in the context of the double pressures of global rankings and local embeddedness. Now, my sense is that things are shifting and new ish, uh, possibilities are coming onto the agenda. Um, I mean, we've seen, um, you know, the, there's been some opting out of the rankings um, in Chinese universities, important ones in case of Nanjing and Renmin. Um, but more generally, I think the, you know, the picture that the rankings have created, you know, which is like one system, all, all similar missions, uh, the, the patterning of global higher education as if it replicates the American or British research university. I mean, that picture is increasingly coming into question with the strengthening of higher education in other parts of the world, outside the Euro-American world, especially. And so, you know, we're seeing different models coming forward as I suppose, having a lot of organic depth and significance. And that means that um, um, there's the possibility for um, a Latin American approach, you know, to come onto the agenda in a way which it hasn't before. Uh, and maybe Latin America as a region more culturally coherent than most other regions in the world. So there's that sort of small possibility. The other thing I think um, that's happening is that the discourse of the um, international organizations about the role of higher education and knowledge is changing. Knowledge economy seems to be in some trouble as a concept. Um, the assumption that if you educate your population to the highest level and you get the best value human capital and it means that you're positioned, um, your nation is positioned best for the foreseeable future is now coming into question. So, um, I mean, there's some worrying possibilities in that. Maybe even a withdrawal of support for higher education might be coming on the agenda in some countries. But um, I think it's a new ball game is what I'm trying to say. So I think everything is shifting. And so this is the time to come forward with new ideas. Now, um, you would think that the best prospect in Latin America is to develop um, a, a notion of regional, regionally defined mission, you know, embedding uh, universities in um, their communities and their nations. And the traditional um, notion of the state building university provides a clear line of development towards that goal. Um, but the private universities have come along in the last 30 years and changed the picture. I don't mean the existence of large non um, non-state uh, uh, religious based organizations, but the new kind of fostering of an elite sector in the private domain rather than the public domain. And they, there's a sort of ambiguity about the mission of these, of these great institutions that have emerged that we've been discussing today. I mean, on one hand, they're orientated towards global standards of excellence. On the other hand, they say they have a public mission and they're orientated to society. Um, I mean, I think ultimately they do depend on national support. So there is a, there's a core link back to their own communities, their own societies for both research and teaching funding. But they seem to be able to move between the two roles when it suits them. I mean, what really embeds them strongly at national level? How can they be brought into a project at national and regional level of devising a new mission for the university? Okay, uh, we are running out of time, but, but we have two, two questions, uh, maybe uh, from uh, Chandra Mohan first, and then Kami, the, the two together, please. Uh, hello, um, um, can you hear me, please? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it, it, it follows on from the, the previous contribution about uh, changing nature of um, uh, of um, the centrality of um, say the um, research uh, based uh, ranking. Now the Times Higher has started uh, an impact um, rankings which follows the uh, UN SDG uh, Sustainable Development Goals. 
it actually changes the focus uh, from um, uh, research embedded uh, ranking to something which is much more wider and, uh, and, and socially responsible and so on. So uh, I, I was wondering whether this could be uh, um, a ranking system which um, uh, could provide Latin America with, uh, uh, with a new uh, focus because uh, traditionally uh, through different stages, uh, Latin America has been contributing to the idea of center periphery and also liberation theology and so on. So in other words, the rooting um, universities and the knowledge production to um, socially defined roles. So my question is, uh, would um, UNSTGs or Times Higher Education's rank, uh, impact rankings make um, some difference uh, in, in Latin America? Thank you. Yes, please came in. Uh, you can raise your question very fast. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the, the speakers. Uh, I, have, I think I don't have like, any time to ask questions and expecting answers, but I, I would like to make uh, two observations. One is, uh, uh, in particular, Professor Odorica's points, I think almost apply to all universities, uh, to different degrees and different directions, perhaps. And so thank you very much for raising this question. Some of the questions, uh, and this is my second point, as some of the questions are not referring to problems, they are referring to future directions. And that, those are questions that many universities in the world may not have in mind at all. So thank you for this very forward looking uh, uh, presentation. Although you, you see this as, as a problem for, for moving forward, but they are actually uh, pointing to new directions. And I think I, can't, I couldn't uh, agree more with uh, Simon that the world is changing so quickly and therefore we cannot stay on what we have now as the problems because it's a deficit model. You can't, it's not a repairing uh, time. It's a moving forward, it's a time for moving forward. So thank you very much for the presentations. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, for finishing, uh, maybe uh, one quick comment from, from Monica and then from uh, Imanol. Monica. Um, I just want to point out that uh, something that was said by Professor Martinson, that I think that um, in Latin America, we're moving, I think we're moving to our own model. We don't, we need rankings like a sig signal to the market, but we are moving with a proper agenda. And I think that probably it's not the world-class university model. I think that is an emerging global model, but it's a regional model. And uh, there is a very nice uh, research uh, conducted by Powell in 1917. And they say that we are developing our native way of doing uh, teaching and research in our universities. But universities are the locus, the place, for developing, development our research national systems too. We have to be conscious of that too. Thanks. Please, Dr. Rodriga, Manuel. Uh, very fast. Uh, I think uh, people are looking out uh, of the box of rankings and world-class universities, but probably not fast enough. Uh, the move, uh, for, for example, the, the expansion of other language journals in the Scopus or Web of Science uh, indexes is so slow that uh, we are not being able to, uh, which was one of the questions, to project uh, our own uh, knowledge building capacities into other uh, areas of the world in terms of uh, like the Chinese not being they're producing so much, but Chinese uh, research uh, journals are not present uh, enough. And as for future directions, I'd say that that is certainly, if we can start arguing about that, especially in the post-pandemic, uh, if, if we can ever talk of a post-pandemic condition, because that is really a question mark uh, for all of us. But all the debate about COVID and universities has been so much referenced to what to do at the short-term level. 
and there has been so uh, little discussion about strategic changes to higher education. I think that opens a window for a lot of reflection and debate. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you. Thank you. No, thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you, Monica, and all, all of you for being in this uh, seminar. Uh, we have to, to finish now. Um, a lot of, of for discussing, especially how to make more global uh, Latin American uh, universities with a regional perspective. And we have a, 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 a seminar on next Thursday that will also talk about internationalization and student mobility in Latin America and higher education. So you are welcome to, to this uh, next webinar on Thursday. And thank you for, for your participation in this uh, webinar. Okay, see you, thank you.